turn it over to Steve, and he's going to come up and dazzle us with his opening remarks.
which was on Sunday morning, and I flunked speech when I was in high school. The only F I'd ever made, and I went in and, and conned the guy into giving me a D, but anyway, I could not speak in front of crowds. And so uh, he said, would you talk at Came to Believe on Sunday? I said, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So all I could do at Came to Believe, I opened a hymn book up and, and I read the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I had no, no, no speaking skill. I could not talk. Now you can't shut me up. <laughs> this is a part of the miracle of our program. <laughs> we go from totally fear from reaching in here for six and eight libriums a day to try to settle myself down after to being able to speak. And that's just a, 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 an absolute miracle. So if any of you all are worried about whether you're carrying the message or not, just hang in there and it'll change for you. So in 81, <clears throat> uh, uh, Jack came into the program, started in going to these retreats, as many of you may uh, be aware, Clarence died in 1984. Well, in, in, on, he's in the hospital. And Grace is there, he's failing, and, we, and, and soon I go to the hospital. And he said, we want to anoint you to carry these retreats on. Hmm? Okay. What's that mean? Well, get on your knees here beside the bed. We did. Clarence anointed us to be, he referred to it, Grace referred to it as passing the mantle. I don't happen to like that. I think it was just he wanted to be, uh, Sue and I to be, be a retreat leader. I don't feel like I've been mantled. And uh, that's, that sounds a little hierarchical to me. I'd a lot rather just be anointed to continue the message uh, that these came to believe the retreats uh, offer us. So that's what we did. Prayed for us. Believe it or not, ten hours later, he's gone. Now what do we do? Well, uh, Grace was still living, so we worked with her, and the, the metamorphosis of these retreats, uh, I'll try to shorten, but part of what you'll find this weekend is there's some things where we may be willing to explore and change, and I'll get into what happened over the years, but 84 rolls around, and we're discovering that uh, the early retreats that Clarence had, people ask me quite a bit of the times, well, how did Clarence take people through the steps of the retreats? He didn't. There was uh, some meetings on Friday night, a pastor or somebody would speak, Saturday morning, Hal Hill would speak, or, or somebody, and then Saturday night, Clarence would speak, and that gap between noon, lunch, and, uh, and six dinner, was spent, uh, the, the last two retreats I went to at Brandon, I, uh, the only fight Clarence and I ever had was over, I ain't staying in that camp. Oh, you've got to stay in the camp. I said, I'm not staying in the camp. There's a day's in, about two miles away, and that's where I'm staying. And so uh, I just, I won that. I didn't, it wasn't a question of winning. I just was a question. I wasn't going to stay with Bob Rathke, who snored, with eight, seven, twelve other guys in a bunk room with two toilets and one sink. I said, I, I uh, and one shower. And I said, I just, uh, I, I'm not, I flunked Boy Scouts, honest to God. I did. They kicked me out. I'm still a Weebelos. <laughs> I went to that first Boy Scout camp, and when they told me to cut the two by four and dig a hole in the ground, that's your retrieve. I said, I'm, I'm done. Out of here. So uh, I'll let y'all be doing the camping. Uh, anyway, so the retreat ground, we went to the uh, continuing, why no steps? Saturday, I remember it well. Dick Stoltz, myself, guy named Jim Page, Dan Roman. We went back to the Days Inn. We watched football. We were sat around the pool. We got tan Saturday afternoon. So 1984, Clarence dies, and we're sitting around talking to Grace and probably Dale. And uh, and saying, what, what are we going to do about this Saturday afternoon? It seems like such a waste of time. Well, why don't we take people through the steps? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, a little rebellion. Well, guess what? <laughs> History, you'll read about it in this book, and I'll read it to you on page 9. It says, 
in Cleveland, because of the articles in the Plain Dealer newspaper and other publications, people were coming into AA so fast, the members couldn't take all those newcomers to the steps on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So Clarence started to pray for a place where he could teach and take them through the steps as a group. He soon received an inquiry card from Walter Bilstein with the address, Bilstein Funeral Home. On his arrival, Clarence found that Walter lived over the carriage house in the back, and Clarence found Walter quite drunk. Now, right away, Clarence saw the answer to his prayer. Walter's hobby was conducting an amateur theater out of his home above the funeral home. He lived at one end of a very large room, on the other end was a stage with a couple hundred old movie seats fastened to the floor. Clarence explained to, Wal explained to Walter, you are a gift from heaven. Walter said, I am? Uh, Clarence told Walter they were going to fill the seats every night, and that's all Walter wanted to hear. At that point, he didn't know what he was going to get the seats filled with, but he knew he was going to get the seats filled. Clarence made Walter a captain in AA, the first <laughs> and only captain in AA, and, uh, and they used Walter's place to teach the program as we do today. So, history shows us that we can take people through the groups. I mean, this was in 1939, 1940. And so the methodology that we use is characteristic of what went on in the old days. The sentence before my story I just read says that the first 260 people who came to AA in Cleveland, 93% never drank again. Folks, this is a winner program. This is a winning program. And that's what message we have came to believe are, are uh, making efforts and succeeding in carrying this message. So, that was 1984. Well, how do we do that? Uh, I seem to recall, confirmed by Gene Morfitt, I said, I think the first time we ever took a group through the 12 steps of AA was in Avery, Wisconsin. Gene says, my dad kept all the programs going back to 1981. He brought them. He said, I looked it up. Sure enough, 1984, your old buddy Steve took a group, first time in Amory, Wisconsin, through the 12 steps. So I go to my records, safely kept. In <laughs> this is... These are my, my worksheets for X number of years. And here's the Bible readings that we, we read on the back. And I made copies of this. He said, oh, I want to copy of this. I'm going to take it back to England. Oh, good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I made copies of the table in the back. But this is how it was. And on the back, here's what we read from Dr. Bob. And here's what we read from the Prayer and Praise. I mean, from, uh, from the Bible, and, uh, and I went through this book. It was all numbered in here, you know, so we're going to start on step one, we're we start on this page, and, and go through there. So it was all, uh, here's step three, step four, yes, go to page 68. So it was all hand done, so to speak. That's the early, early steps. And this went on, and then we finally said, oh, we need a prayer, we need a prayer. Well, Harold Hill was still alive. And Liz and, and uh, several of us and Grace was around and said, okay, let's design a third step prayer. So we came out with this very fancy, extremely fancy, uh, here's your third step prayer, which is now in, in your book. Here's the extremely fancy fourth step inventory. And then in the back, you have the seventh step prayer. Oh, people say, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. Holy smokes, that's awful. Okay. Uh, let me see where it is. Uh, someone has taken my paper. Could I'm I sure have. It was, me. Uh, was it you? Oh, it wasn't? Was it? No, anyway. Uh, she didn't take it. <laughs> she didn't take it. Oh, it's my fault. This is the extensive. In Clarence Snyder's handwriting, and there are copies of them in the back, I did not write my name on the top, because I sure don't want you guys seeing my four-step moral inventory. <laughs> this is in Clarence Snyder's handwriting. There are copies in the back. 
If somebody comes to you and says, you can't do that that way, I say, well, an old timer, that's me, an old timer showed me his four-step inventory. Do not tell Sue that lust is on here. Uh, she knows about egotistical, lacking in common everyday honesty, lacking tolerance, impatient, she knows about those, selfish, but lo and behold, I have ambition, I have compassion, humility, I, I ran out of that when I learned to, to talk in front of groups. <laughs> Sense of humor, regard for others. Anyway, in, in the back, if anybody wants to get the inside scoop on Steve Foreman, but the thing is, when somebody says that, says, you know, guess what I picked up in the retreat? Uh, gee whiz, uh, Clarence Snyder, in his handwriting, not in mine. So this is, this is having a full step. I mean, this is not a novel. And I have seen people come to his house with the novel, and I have seen him take the yellow pad and throw it in the trash. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is what we're trying to carry in this message. But 1984 became the Walter Wildstein approach back to history, back to, back to the past, and we began doing the 12 steps in the afternoon. Gave people the message. I mean, that's what the program's about, this 12-step program. I think everybody in here has enjoyed that uh, that feature, and we'll discuss it over the weekend because there are two or three ways of going through this as part of the talk of the weekend. How, how we continue to carry this message? It isn't a question of whether you use this book or not. It's not that question. It's whether you're talking about how the message, how the steps are delivered, and that'll be a topic of our of our discussion. So 84 rolls along, and first. About 10 years, I would guess. I don't know when the raps got involved in taking over. We had two retreats, and it got heavy, and it got, and you all run a retreat. After a while, you think, what are we doing this for? And then I go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got to remember them, this. I got to remember the mission. I got to, okay, God, you know, put it, inflate that body again and, you know, send me in. But anyway, Jack and BJ said, you know, you guys are, Two of years of a load. Uh, let us take over uh, one of them. So we swap now, one in May, one in November, one in May, which has been fantastic. Uh, you get to hear uh, a little different slant on things from, the, from, from both of us, from both families, from both recoveries. And it is, uh, it's been a joy to work with uh, Jack and DJ over uh, these last 15 years. So, then rolls around in the early 2000s, and uh, we're saying, you know, this this way here is getting, uh, you know, wore out. It's uh, too much. You got to carry that. Everybody, not everybody, brings their big book. They change the big book. They took the stories out. They do this. They do that. Why don't we put together something that carries this message to? the next generation and makes it simpler for all to take people through the steps. I mean, in, in real rock gut bottom, news is all you got to do is get this book out and sit down with somebody and go through the steps. I mean, that's the oversimplicity of this uh, beautiful ring. Now, there's history in here too, uh, but how did this get done? Well, we're sitting around or whatever. Somebody pushed us. It was probably Dale. Uh, they said, "Look, we got to do that, or BJ, or somebody." You know, uh, it was uh, let's get this thing written. So we started on it, and probably a two-year period. Back phone calls, back and forth, uh, you know, emails, or whatever we communicated in those days. It's the dark ages. <laughs> <laughs> but this is in about 2003, I'm guessing. Finally, we reached the uh, conclusion, okay, it's ready to print. We got Dick Burns to do the, uh, some of the editing. We got uh, a lot of history in here. We pieced together from our own memories, a lot of things from Harold Hill, from, from Grace, from Clarence. Uh, we got in here uh, in the back, 
uh, some of the best kept secrets about how to start a retreat. I mean, literally back page about 96 or 7, appendix 5, start your own retreat. So it's in here already. We're refining it this weekend, and we've even got in here a sample program. You know, if you want a program, it's in here. And so there's a lot of information in this book, and there's a lot of bibliography, and it was put together. It was a, a real labor of love, of, of, of hard work. I mean, B.J. and Sue edited and rewrote, and Jack and, and, and Carol, and all of us just kind of pieced it together. We'd have conference calls. So here we have the book now. And uh, our goal, as you've heard tonight, is to, is to go beyond this book to the, the real how-to. Purposes weekend. Let's refine it. Let's have a video. We're going to put a video together. These people probably help drill it down to a couple hours, an hour maybe. Uh, other things we're doing is Sue has been running this website for uh, however long we've had the website, 20 years. It's getting heavy, folks. There's a lot of information. There's more retreats starting. Uh, we're, we're investing in a, in a new website. Uh, we're also going to ask you to think about over the weekend how can you get involved because as a part of that website we may want blogs, we may want Facebook, we may want uh, Joe Blow, somebody says that, may, may have a question, you know, little question boxes on some of these things and so we're going to put this hopefully together and we're also going to ask you, where can you fit in? Because we're all re repeating, I'm 74 years old. Jack is older than I. And we got to get this done. We've got to pitch this together. So you and you know, the next generation have a message to carry. It's simple. It's very simple, really. How does it get more simpler than this one page piece here? And we're, our job, should we decide to accept it, is to go to back to our meetings, back to our hometowns, back to encouraging people to start retreats. And so we're piecing all this together into a, an understandable 21st century, I hope, method of communication. So there will be a lot of involvement in that. Now. Have I, what have I left out of the history, Jack? There's probably a lot. Maybe. No, Steve, um, I think you covered it all. I think that you need to mention that the legacy book, we have quotes from three publications. From the big book, third edition. From the New American Standard Version of the Bible. And Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. Now, those quotes that you read in the legacy book are verbatim. You can check us out. We didn't add or subtract. We didn't edit. We didn't do anything different. We made no changes. The nice thing about it is you don't have to have those books with you now when you go through the steps. It made it a faster process. Right. It's convenient. But they're verbatim. So, that's how this tool got developed. Dale, you have a thought? Just the thought about the book, the fact that it's available, people have come to our retreats because they found the book first. They've taken, used the book to go through the steps, take people through the steps, found out about our retreat later, and attended one of our retreats later. So the publications are miracles in themselves of what they did. Well, we've, we're now over 15,000 of these. I'll give you an idea. We've had our fourth... Uh, Printing is coming up, which will be 20,000. So they're going somewhere. But, uh, and, and we know mainly where they go. We're now sending out about 200 a week. I've sent out over 200 the last week. And this is another part of the legacy I want to get into. Who's going to do this? Who's, who, this is run out of my office. I, I showed uh, Nathan and I showed Gene and, and Jack. I get a little room at the office and it's stacked full of AA stuff and we order these 5,000 at a time and they come in 50 boxes of 100 and they're this, this big. But who's going to, I watch that email every day, I get an email every day, a phone call, 
virtually every day. Uh, Sue gets a, get emails on the uh, website. What's, what's this? Where did, where did that happen? Do we, do people call with questions. How? What is this fourth step? I cannot believe. And so, uh, yours truly is uh, you know, probably eight hours a week doing something with regard to this book or questions or retreats or so on. Who's going to do that? And I'm looking around at this crowd and I'm saying, okay, folks, step it up. <laughs> Step it up because we're gonna we're gonna need help. Uh, my son is not an alcoholic. He's been to this retreat. He's been in the office there with me. Uh, he could take care of that if I fell over tonight. You know, the, the, it would it would keep going, but it isn't going to be the same because Steve at, our, at, o, at came to believe .org is on here, and, and Steve's phone number is on here, and Steve's address is on here. And I'm not bragging about that, but it's a necessity. He's going to do it. So we've taken that monkey uh, opportunity, you describe it however you want, <laughs> and it's us. you got to think about it. Part of this weekend is we're throwing out this opportunity. We've got a website, we've got books, we've got phone calls, we've got all kinds of things that go on that nobody sees. You know, it's below the radar. Somebody will call them. You know, so we're, it's not an organization, this is a labor of love. The Clarence said AA is not to be made money, it's about an avocation. You have an avocation. Uh, anybody in the room thinks we're getting rich selling these for $3.50 <laughs> needs to get us, that includes posting. How many have you sold, Steve? 15,000. So that's a lot. He's what a, we're, we're making a killing. We're making a <laughs> in volume here. I bought six well, it's, it's not a profit-making organization, but I am not losing money on it. If you guys that know me know, uh, my nickname is Frugal Foreman. So $3.50, I just raised the price to $4 about two months ago because the postage just keeps going up and keeps going up. And my business has been supporting the postage. And my little CFO asked me about three weeks ago, said, you know, you spend about $100 a week, or a month, excuse me, a month, sending out these books, and it all comes out of the fringe benefit, which is our insurance business. I said, oh, forgot about that. Let me raise the price. Anyway, I'm not, I'm, I'm dwelling on these things cost money, but they are very important. I will move on. Uh, want me to open the retreat? All right, I'm opening the retreat now, so the new hat is coming on. And I'm Steve Foreman, a grateful recovered alcoholic. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. We're going to say a short prayer. Father, anoint us all with the wisdom and knowledge of your Holy Spirit. Those here whose hearts and minds need to be open, please open them. Those of us who could communicate and spread the word that you've given us to carry this message effectively in the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray for that knowledge. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Amen. Amen. We're opening a retreat. We say we're recovered. We say a prayer. So, I've given you the history, but somebody will always be screwing in the seat no matter when you go speak about the word recovered. So I love it. I love for somebody to say, you can't say that. Why did you look at me when you did that? I say, anybody got a big book? Oh, yeah, you got a big book. Let's go all the way back. To the first page. <laughs> Let's go there today. How many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism? Oh my. Let's go all the way back to the forward here on page XII. It says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered, recovered is the main purpose of this book. Mm, my goodness. Yeah. 
Great. Now we're going to shift all the way back here to the stories on page 164, 165. It says how 43 alcoholics recovered from their malady. So, thank you for sharing that I can't say recovered, but I just want you to know that the book was written by people who recovered. My sponsor, Clarence Schneider, told me, when you go to a meeting, you say, you are recovered. Because the disease of alcoholism has been cured and taken from your body by Jesus. Amen. I don't know if I'm going to say that in a meeting, but I say that at this retreat, because, and at other retreats, because the desire to drink was taken from me by my higher power, Jesus C. And I use that a lot, and I always usually get a little bit of a wrinkle there where you say, I have an anonymous higher power, Jesus C. <laughs> usually happens. So you get a little levity into it, but bingo, you've hit them right in the middle. So I'm recovered. Clarence told me I was recovered. I'm going to be recovered. My brain, my subconscious, my unconscious wants to hear that I am recovered. So that's what I'm saying. So when you go to a meeting, when you open your meeting, stir them up. <laughs> Say I'm recovered. How'd you get recovered? Talk about the retreat. That's opportunity knocking. So and each of you in your packet will receive a how to open a retreat. And I talk about recovered a little bit there. We would read our vision statement now. Lives are changed by connecting spiritual belief in the 12 steps. So I would say that's what our vision at King to Believe retreats are. And our mission statement is to make available to all a method of recovery taught by the founders of AA, resulting in life changing experiences. That's a new item that I'm going to add to the opening remarks. It has never been put that way before, but I think it's extremely effective, and you'll see it here. As I'm going to tell people the reason this retreat exists, our vision and our mission. Welcome to both. Glad you're here. We hope when you leave Sunday, things are different than when you arrive tonight. So, I've explained the word why I've recovered, I've explained our mission statement, I've opened with a prayer, opened with, uh, with that, so then I would typically say, okay, you know, we're, we, we all know how it works, but we don't read it here at the Came to Believe Retreats, we just tell people how it works, so how does it work? Real good! And there'll be enough in your new meeting that somebody's going to have been here, they're going to say, real good, they said it works real good. That's how it works. <coughs> so we hope you're here for the weekend to see how good it can work for you. So hang in there, guys. This is going to be an exciting ride for the newcomers. <coughs> so new people welcome. At this point, we would have all the newcomers stand up. And they'll typically line up around this room. We give them a packet. Uh, you've gotten a packet here of some of the material. We give them a DVD uh, of, uh, or a CD of Clarence. Let's talk how it works. But each uh, retreat I would recommend, and we do it as introducing the people that come up. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm from, where are you from? I know where you're from. But they would say, where are you from? And uh, go sit down. We also recommend somebody count those because it's, you know, here in November, we had 50 new people. So it's impressive to stand up and set the end and say, guess what, guys? 50 new people. So it's good to, to know who the new people are and recognize those new people. So they, enter, they get introduced. Then we would typically ask that we have what's called an AA longevity stand, which means all alcoholics stand up. You don't have to. 
and we say, okay, uh, those who have been uh, clean less than six months, take a time period, sit down. Those less than a year, sit down, and then go in increments of five or ten years. Don't take a lot of time doing that. But the last one standing, in this case, would be Liz Rogers, who's going to say, or Thomas Page, or somebody, he's here somewhere too, uh, 44 years or 43 years. So we're trying to let the newcomers see who has uh, some longevity, who has had some experience, who are the old timers. And so we have a longevity stand, and then we do the same for the Alanon people, so that the Alanon folks can stand and do the, the sit down. And typically at that point, we would have an Alanon uh, lady or man. Uh, and in our case, it's usually been Sue or BJ come up, take a ver an explanation, five minutes or ten minutes or so about Al-Anon, what we have to offer during the Al the weekend. And we offer an Al-Anon meeting uh, at two or three times during during our retreat. We recommend you do that if you need, when we're all done with this weekend and your format of the retreat looks similar to this one, then you're going to have uh, an Al-Anon person uh, communicate, and there'll be literature that Al Anon person might bring, and so forth. So, then I want to introduce uh, the speakers for the weekend. Uh, you guys all know, and I won't go around introducing, but you know who the legacy team is. Uh, one of our legacy team we lost uh, four years ago, five years ago. Seven. Uh, oh, seven. Seven years ago, Gene Morphus. Dale, Gene's still here. Thank you. I'll get you guys next time. <laughs> I think I'm here. Now. Anyway, uh, Carol Morfin is here, and uh, she and, and, and Dale were part of the um, team. So I would introduce them. Typically, I would, if there were other uh, retreat leaders in the room, I would introduce them, uh, and this would be part of the introduction. Then I'd introduce this, the hosts for the meeting. I would introduce Kim Spencer because she collects the money. And I would say that you need to get in the room until you see Ken and Kim, unless you want to sleep in your car, and you've got 165 bucks. And so we uh, emphasize uh, collection of funds uh, in advance before they get their key. And uh, uh, so that is an a, a, a introduction of uh, who's here, who's speaking, and so forth. Uh, part of this introduction would be also where are the meeting rooms. Here sometimes we have a separate meeting going on. The 12 steps would be in this room. Uh, when you come into the 12 steps, you need to bring a pencil. So I would tell them that. And uh, you'll be given a manual and a book, a legacy guide to go through those 12 steps. Uh, we would then probably explain our small groups. Either Suzanne or, or, uh, or Kim would come up talk about the small groups. As you saw coming here, each of you has a number. We would say uh, those are your group and introduce the group leader. So that's, that that uh, person with a number on their badge can follow that leader. The, and then I'll say that uh, our leader six, six will be over here, leader two. Lot lay out where these small group uh, meetings are held. Uh, I would make some announcements during that time, and I have a couple to make here as an example. Uh, the restrooms, you think, well, there's a meeting going on out there. There's not. We go out the back, and if there are dozens of people sitting in that room, that's okay. You walk through there to you know, where everybody knows where the bathrooms are here. So do not be deterred by the fact that there's a meeting there. Do you want to say something? Oh, well, hi. All right. <laughs> anyway. Coffee will, will be out here most of the time. It's a, it, but if you do not find coffee here, go to the lobby. 24-7, there's coffee, cups, and everything up in the main lobby. So it's there. We got a few snacks back here. This is not load them up weekend like normal. Not a lot of sugar. We want everybody to stay awake. So uh, we've got some snacks back there. Uh, breakfast starts at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, be done about, uh, it'll go to about 8.15. We're going to meet back here at 8.30, crank up tomorrow. We go to lunch at 12.15. We'll be back in here at 1. This is a working weekend. 
and uh, you will be severely chastised. <laughs> You're not here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will say Nathan on you. What time is dinner tomorrow? It will be vicious. <laughs> So I'll make a few announcements. Uh, we'll typically have a, what's called a free literature table over here. We'll say that's free. Thomas Page for years and Carol Morfitt for years before that. Carol Morfitt Welsh was, uh, ran our uh, literature table for sale. We would have a for sale table uh, and Thomas would run that and then when we have a free literature table I would announce that. Uh, there's a, we typically would have a recording, a, a CD guy over here recording. Uh, I'd say, okay, John Hunter be here. They're five bucks a piece or six bucks a piece. I would announce that. Um, then we got uh, housekeeping, don't smoke in the rooms, uh, stay in the meetings, be as quiet as you possibly can, don't go slamming the doors, whatever. Uh, newcomers. I would point out, okay, you guys are here, new coming, uh, and I would go into my first retreat where I would be uh, filled with fear. Uh, I don't know what these people are going to do to me. I got no clue. They're looking at me kind of funny. Uh, they're, they're, they're eyeballing me. And so I was a little bit hesitant about what's going on. I want to point that out to the newcomer here so they know that's normal. You know, to be, but don't worry. How about not worrying? This will be a new spiritual experience for you. Uh, please keep an open mind. Uh, you know, what is your what is your task? Newcomers, go through the 12 steps. It'll be one, you know, 10 a.m. in the morning, whatever the time is, wherever it is. Go through those steps. And you group leaders, I want you to insist and point out to the newcomer in your group that they go through these 12 steps. Uh, so your job, uh, folks, if you like to do it, is to have that life-changing experience here. I take a minute or two and might explain what did that mean to me. I came here, I life changed, <laughs> been totally different last 35 years. You got a chance to do that. You can do that this weekend. If you're sitting on the fence about something, get involved. You know, get involved with what we got going on here. Listen. Ask questions, talk to some experienced people. The experienced people will have a, typically a ribbon or some identifying thing. So you want to talk to them, and we're all here to help you. So I would just welcome them. Pretty much you'll see this outline in your, in your packet. Uh, in my case, it usually ends up uh, writing a bunch of notes on the side for whatever reason. There are some fill in the blanks where you're going to write who's, who's the host, who's the speaker, uh, and so on. So it, it gets, but that's an outline. Uh, I'd like at this time to introduce Nathan Smith as our facilitator. And, uh, ooh, it's getting late, man. But anyway, that was my job. I appreciate it. That's not what you want to do. All right, Jeff has something that he's going to read here for us. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Steve. I feel like I just opened You just opened a retreat. Yeah. My name is Jack Rapp. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Welcome, everybody. Wow. One afternoon or one morning, we were sitting in the living room, and we were talking about... Uh, Something from uh, the manufacturer's handbook, by the way, that's what Hal called the Bible. And the word remnant came up. And BJ said, well, you know, remnant, that's just what came to believe is. And I got thinking about it, and you know, she's exactly right. It says in, in Webster's, it says that remnant is a small remaining part or a trace. Well, that's what we are, guys, of what took place out in the Midwest back in the late 1930s. Now, several activities of everyday life are associated with these words. Objects or people may be separated from larger groups by selection, assignment, or destruction. What's left over is the residue, in the case of people, those who remain. Noah and his family 
may be understood as survivors or a remnant of a divine judgment in the flood. And that's in Genesis 6, 5 through 8, and 7, 1 through 23. The same could be said of Lot when Sodom was destroyed, again in Genesis. Jacob's family in Egypt, again in Genesis. Elijah and the 7,000 followers of the Lord, which is found in Kings. The Israelites who went into captivity in Ezekiel. They were survivors because the Lord showed mercy on those who had steadily believed in him and the righteousness of their lives. They were spared. They were a remnant of what was left. Or what was left of the remnant. In the New Testament, Paul accounts Elijah's complaint and God's subsequent response found in 1 Kings. This exchange from the, the apostle concludes that the remnant still exists. A remnant is what several New Testament terms call the faithful or the elect. The chosen for his purpose, a remnant. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant that remains by grace, and that's from Romans. Remnant is, the remnant is scattered. This expression in Hebrew has a primary meaning of broken to pieces are scattered and dispersed by force. It means something akin to explode. When an object explodes, it flies apart. It no longer can do what it was meant to do. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. AA itself has become powerless to accomplish what it once did. Power in the Hebrew word is for hand. Hand symbolizes strength, effectiveness, and the ability to do work. To accomplish, to act. The translators have taken it to being a more abstract might or power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. You'll tell about me in Jerusalem, and counties all over Judea, Samaria, AA meetings, NA meetings until the end of the earth. The remnant came to believe, has the ability to do an effective work because it is not shattered. It has power. It's important that we exercise the power given to us. When a door shut, God opens a window. AA continues to set up roadblocks. But avenues are paid for the remnant. It's so now time to do as possible. Peter recommends, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. Make your calling and election sure. If you don't do these things, if you do these things, you'll never stumble. So our salvation recovery will be supplied to you abundantly by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God gave this power to a spiritual remnant called King to Believe. All right? Yeah. 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 Thank you all. Woo. Okay. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. You guys could all do it that good, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. All right. So now, you all have these at your table, minus my red writing. Go back to your small groups. You're going to have about 15 minutes as a small group to answer two questions. Normally I won't read them, but here I will. Do we need an opening statement? Okay. And how can we successfully incorporate this into our own retreats? Wrestle with that in your small groups over the next 15 minutes. As we go through the weekend, don't forget, if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have problems, I am here to serve you. Raise your hand, flag me down, I will come and help you with whatever the need is. So if you will go back to your groups, I'll give you about three minutes, and then we'll begin. Make sure you know, get somebody to take notes as a scribe, and somebody to report. Thank you. We got a plan. We have a plan. You need to speak into the microphone. <laughs> we say something. Hold on one second. Now you do it. Look at this shop. If I had a hammer, what would you do? I'd hammer in the morning. Yes, sir.
Get a job and go buy a hammer. That's what I've done. All right, so this is going to be good because Dale's first. He's been around a while. He should have a thick skin, so we can see how this works out with Dale. All right, Dale, so do we need an opening statement? What yes. you just figure out? Yes, do? we do. All right, well, that was easy, we wasn't it? Yes, it was. You don't feel too beat up? Not at all. Outstanding. All right, so how can we successfully incorporate these into the retreats? Well, our idea in the group, our idea in the group was to prepare a, a timeline video type of presentation to assist the uh, leader of the group. So you would play a little clip and that would take some technical abilities and skills in your group and play a little clip showing the history. Dr. Bob and Bill, Clarence, um, Steve and Sue, um, Jack and BJ, you know, and, and see, a, see a timeline, a growth, carrying the message from the original through to today. And we think that would be good for each group because it would tie us all together as an organization rather than having individual groups. We'd be more of a total, if we used that, to introduce. Now, you'd still have the individual personality of the retreat leader right. to fill in the blanks after that. You know, this, we do our steps in a little different manner than this group, but this is why we do it that way. And so the retreat leader would still be delivering a message, making it personal. Yes, the, the, the retreat leader would still use his personality and his abilities and talents to start the retreat, to begin the retreat. The only thing it would be was you would have a, a little history lesson that wasn't in words as much as pictures. On a video. Something, yeah, something yeah. that's standardized. Okay. okay. All right. That's good. Um, Mike, thank you very much. I don't know what a TED talk is. Yes, yeah, so just like that. Yeah. A short video is what we're talking about here. Sue Foreman referred to TED talk. If any of you know what that is, these are the little 16, 18 minute pe talks people give. Too long. Um, so something like that is what you're talking about. We were right? thinking maybe three minutes. Three minutes? Something three minutes, three to five minutes. Just a brief overview. And why we do what we do is because of the legacy we're carrying on. This is what they did. And then so after that timeline video, what exactly would the retreat leader be saying in the introduction? Well, we're talking about the format of the retreat. Okay. Uh, the speakers that are here, the out-of-staters, the other retreat leaders, um, people you need to talk to, you know, people with the, tag, the special tags, um, a general feel for the schedule, I guess. Okay. And that kind, of, that kind of thing. So in each of your packets, there is a opening remarks. Did you guys see this? Yeah. 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 So one of the things I think they did was give you some sort of an outline here. Is, did you see this, Dale? Um, I think that that will be something that you guys can reference going forward with your opening remarks to bring some uni universality to the opening remarks. Okay. Does that look like it might be helpful? It looks very helpful. Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dale. Would number two please come up? Oh, 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 oh. Okay, you're a big dude. You're going to have to raise that thing up, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is Sean Higgins from Avery, Wisconsin. Is that? No, Amory, Wisconsin. I'm sorry. Amory. See, I get there. See, you later. Thank you. All right. So do we need an opening statement? Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. So is everyone in this room in agreement that we needed an opening? Yes. yes. Is everyone in this room in agreement that it needs to be done well? Yes. yes. So when we started tonight, some of you didn't know me, right? So I made a first impression. Yeah. Yes. Could I do okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. But could I do it again if I didn't? No. The opening statement is our first impression. It is vital. You get one chance. See, I didn't wear a hat tonight because I was going to make a first impression. Tomorrow I'll have a hat on. We can't let our guard down on that opening statement. So how do you think that we can successfully incorporate these opening statements into the retreats? Well, as a group, we decided... As a group? <laughs> we decided that there should be... Um, 
some a suggested format that would include the mission statement, the vision, a brief history, and some core values that also stay autonomous to the groups themselves. Outstanding. Awesome. So one of the things we talked about uh, over here with the legacy group is indeed the history and the, the information that goes into that. Well, for all of us, see, I know all of you know the legacy books forward and backwards, right? You've read them and read them. Well, all that history is in there, okay? So when you're looking for it, that's a great place to go for it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Nope. All right. John, Number three. Pardon? Did you read that? Did I? Uh, just drop it to five here and go by. Come on. Number three. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting there. Is that better? Yeah. All right, so do we need an opening statement? Yes, we need an opening statement. Uh, I'm going to be a little more objective. Yes, please do. Uh, who are we here for this weekend? And I'm an old timer. Yep. It has to focus on, on the newcomer. <coughs> the newcomer. Uh, we all know what this is. They don't. Like in November, we had 60 new people. I don't know about you, when you go to something brand new, and you were right, first impressions, everything, they need to know why they're here. But a lot of times, they're going to really know why they came through their sponsor, through whoever brought them. But we have a lot of people go on the internet and say, I'm going to that retreat, and they walk through the door and they know nothing about this place. Yeah. Zero. And first impression is important. Um, and I thought what we were going to do in here, and you correct me, that we'll maybe in a way have a uniform, so every retreat will sort of have the same opening. You know, I don't know, I'm just putting that out there. Okay. Uh, but I think it should be short because, you know, we can get, alcoholics can get long-winded. Now, I, I love Dale's idea, but at our retreat, I don't know how we'd have a video. We don't have that means. So we do it by mouth, unless we can find a techie to hook that up. You know, and I'll say this finally, the world is full of information people. Facebook, Internet, Twitter, everybody's into information. So they respond by information. They're almost trained, you know, unless they're one day sober. You know, and like you said, the first impression is, is the most important. But I think for a brand new person, their thought is, what, what's going to happen to me this weekend? And why am I here? And that should be in that statement, simply. You know, keep it simple is one of our slogans. And don't get me wrong, the history and the video was great, but you can't overload them with too much information too quick. Mm -hmm. I love about you when I first got sober, you know, mind overload here. And it's wonderful to put all this out. Now, that all I'm saying here is my, our opinion, our suggestions. Uh, but keep it concise. Because there's a lot of stuff to go through over the weekend. If, if you get too bogged down with too much time in every segment, you're going to lose it. And one final thing, I believe foundational is very important. It's, it's very important. The Bible is the same, will always be the same. The big book is the same. When they went to rewrite, I thought, oh my God, no. It's perfect. It's perfect. These retreats have worked for, for how long is it, Jack? 60 years? Or 40 years now? It works perfect. Let's not take away from the foundation. And we have to believe the blue book has worked wonderfully for years. So I'm all, I always have a fear with new age stuff. They're going to they're going to change it and, and think they're going to make it better. But it, it works just the way it is. No, don't go away yet. I'm not done with you. Oh. All right. So no, you did. You actually in all that you did a great job in talking about how we can successfully incorporate this into the retreats. But I want to use you for an example, just for a moment. Because you, you, you're going to give me a chance to point something out that's going to help us this weekend. Okay. How long have you been sober? At 38 years. Okay. He is an old-timer. And he got to come up here and he shared it in a way that was a little outside of the format. He gets grace. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you haven't been sober 38 years, I would appreciate it. Let's stick to the format. You can come up and share like that anytime because that was great information. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that goes for any of you that have been around a long time. If you've been around sober over 30 years and you come up here, you just let me know. You get a lot of grace.
<laughs> All right, number four. Here we go. Yay! All right. How you doing? All right. So you tell them who you are, not me. I'm Sharon from New Richmond, Wisconsin. Hi, Sharon. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Um, we do agree. Need, need them. We need them. All right. Um, what we first talked about was the vision and the mission should be on posters at every retreat and standing there at every one of them all weekend long. Woo! When I came in and I read them and I thought, wow, that's what we need. Awesome. So that's what we came up with was that. And then also, this is kind of, and I don't know exactly, but to go with, you have to have a strong leadership. Jean and I, we have talked about it where we don't always agree, but we learn to agree. And I can come back and say, we, I think we should do this, and he would all, I don't know, but we talk about it, and we're okay with it, and we don't bring our disagreement to the retreat thing. Amen. <coughs> awesome. right. So for us, that's kind of what we talked about in our group. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, when you go to uh, a talk somewhere, and the guy makes a lot of points, and he says, will you please save your applause till the end? Yeah. <laughs> I think they'll have video problems, probably, if there's applause throughout. Um, so one thing I want to comment on that I'm noticing, the questions and the people coming up, it's intentionally limiting, okay? <laughs> no, no. Once all the retreat leaders come up, then we're going to open this up and there's a lot more to discuss. So just because, don't think that, oh, you're done. We're going to continue to visit this once the small group leaders are here, okay? I didn't want you guys to feel like, man, he's really pushing this and he's cutting us off. I'm not. We're going to come back. All right? Uh, number five? Oh, Charles. <laughs> My name's Charles McCullough. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic and uh, humble spokesman for group number five. <laughs> uh, I'm, here to make, I'm here to make an impression with a hat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to stick to the questions. So do we need an opening statement? Absolutely. Okay. The answer to that would be duh. So if you were starting <laughs> an opening statement with your group, what would be your process of incorporating that successfully into the retreat? Primarily an introduction. Um, an introduction and some basic information. I don't want to get off course, but I really like Dale's idea as, as, as for a short video about this right here and uh, yeah, and especially going back to Dr. Bob and then and moving it right through Clarence and Steve to Jack yeah. and the way it is now but to have a leader to have a leader open it up with an introduction ask some basic questions because I think it opens a line of communications it minimizes confusion that, that can get started you know, it says in the big book that the alcoholic is a very sick person. I have personal experience with that. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, you come in with assumptions. You can come in with negative assumptions, and it, and it minimizes that stuff. Um, it makes people feel at home, and it's just a, it's a duh question. Yes. And that's awesome. what I've always experienced here and everywhere I've went. We did have some experience in our group with someone who uh, had been in a retreat where there was no introduction. And there was some stumbling, they said, and so it just gets things moving in a positive direction. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Number six. Hey. <laughs> How you doing, Lyle? Doing great, Nathan. Will you introduce for your kids? Sure. Kid. Lyle, grateful recovered addict. Lyle. 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 We talked Lyle. about the... Uh, oh, yes, by the way, yes. And that's, we didn't feel there's much more to say about it. Um, we do believe that it should have a, a uniform opening statement that raises people's expectations from a seasoned person who can explain what the retreat does uh, and, and give people hope and to give a history that, that allows for the legitimacy of the retreat. The history of it is important because it, it talks about the roots of it and why it matters and why it's true. Uh, we thought that you should be uh, conscious of the newcomers who come in typically anxious and fearful. Um, identifying the newcomers might help ease that, show them they're not alone in that, uh, and talk about um, who we're here for include the family in it. When families are here, they're an important part of the process. Uh, and just make everybody feel comfortable through that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, now it's the fun part. We open the door 
on the opening statement with that. That was all that was intended to do. Now, we experienced when we were working on this, things came off the tracks a little bit because everyone wanted to speak at once. If you want to speak, this is your chance, but please raise your hand and I'll call on you. It's vitally important that we keep the video in mind. Okay. Now, let me ask a question of the video people. Is this microphone need to go around to everyone? Is it cordless? Do they need to just come up here when I call on them? You got it. All right. So, um, does anybody have anything else? Any questions or any comments about the opening statement that they'd like to lead us off with? This is our open discussion time. Well, come on up here, Janice, from Johnson City. Johnson City? <laughs> I'm Janice Babish from Johnson City, and I'm a very opinionated person. And I, I came up here to say this because I didn't get to say it in our group because we ran out of time. But I'm under the assumption about this bit video thing. When I'm driving my car down the road and I see that big billboard with the flashing lights and the blue and the green that says, came to believe retreat, it's going to get my attention. So this video that we're talking about, you go online and you see it, it's got the family, it's got the alcohol, I mean, you know, whatever. But putting in the part about the experience, life-changing experience, if I'm just trolling the internet, which is something I don't do, but a lot of people do, and it's so anointed and dynamic that they want to know what it came to believe. So I believe we should have a universal billboard, a video, or whatever, that every retreat used the same one to attract people to the retreats. Okay, so let me push on that a little bit. Do you think that if we used a video to introduce all the retreats to bring unity, which was one of our goals, do you think that would depersonalize it and create a problem? No. 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 Charles says no. Suzanne? I think that it's Come up here if you have more than a yes or no. I have more than a yes or no. You want it on video. They can go back and chat. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Suzanne. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic, and my thought on that is that we do want to have something that's universal. I love that idea, Janice. I think that's a really great idea. I also think it should be personal. I don't like the idea of a video because I think it takes away from the humanness of what we're doing. We don't want this video to be what we see at every retreat. So my thought would be, yes, uh, I think it should be universal. No, I don't think it should be a video. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, Suzanne. Wild, did you want to comment on that? Sure. We had talked about the, uh, the universality of, of the opening statement, but done through the personality of someone who was one of the leaders and experienced in the retreats. You can have the best of both worlds. You can have that <coughs> uniform delivery, but through a personality that you're going to get to know over the weekend. Right. Stay here. I'm going to pick on you. Okay. So, I hear what you're saying. Steve delivered a message. It, do you, is it tenable, is it realistic for the person starting a retreat to take this outline and deliver a message like Steve delivered it, bringing in history, authenticity, and some of the other components? Yes. Wow. So what might it take for that to happen? Well, I've never, I agree I've never led a retreat, but I've been to them, and I've experienced it, and I've learned from Steve and Jack and... Sue and BJ, and, I, and so I've, as I've learned from these other people, that's an impact on my life personally. As I relate that history, there's a personal nature to it for me. Yeah, and I do agree that it is possible to do that, and we're going to get into that. Thank you, Lyle. Come on. Hi, my name is Kim, and I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. I like Janice, I'm a very opinionated person. But I, so this is what I have to say about that. The, you know, what I find very, um, very important is when Steve first got up here, when he did the opening with us, is he shared his personal experience with us. He shared his story with us. And, and at every retreat and an opening, we get that from either Jack or Steve. And I think that impacts, you know, because A, he's got heart talking to heart. 
you know, and I think in a video we're going to miss that. You know, it, you know, it, you don't get the heart to heart, and that's the sense there. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dean. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dee. I'm a grateful, recovered alcoholic. What a great! I managed to speak in front of you, nervous in the USA. Okay. Um, She's from Alabama, in case you all <laughs> Okay. Um, in the retreat that we run, I think it's really important to have the founders um, brought out in front of the newcomer who who is hopeless who doesn't know what's going to happen next, who thinks they're going to die or wants to die. So they want hope, and that comes from the founders. What we do is we do have the leader will open up with the heart story, the history, um, talking about you know, the experience of Paul Doyle coming over here and meeting Steve and all that. Well, what we do do afterwards is we show a video of Clarence, um, Clarence's video, and we recommend that newcomers go and watch that. That gives that. I think we could add to the armamentarium when they, the word that means that you've got a load of armour and a load of uh, weapons or yeah. uh, tools. The armouring. Whatever. Words. This is two o'clock in the morning in, in the UK. I'm a bit tired. <laughs> so I think that if we could just get some stuff from Jack and from um, Liz and Steve that we could use within, because we have different retreats. We have two a year down in, in the south. If we had different, um, we have people come back. So they want to see different stuff as well. So I just think it would be good to have some stuff to choose from. But I do think we need to have the heart, which was mentioned that Kim said at the beginning, that you open it up and you look at the alcoholic and you look at the drug addict and you say, I've been there too. I've, I've been there. I, and I'm with you. I'm, I'm a recovered alcoholic. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. So this is, this is incredible. We're getting such great information here, and it's, it's proving the point that I made at the beginning, that there's room for more than one right. Look, nobody gets up and delivers the message just like Steve. Thank goodness, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> nobody's going to deliver it the same. That isn't what's important. We all bring, just like in the Gospels. The Gospels were written by different people. God used their character to reach people. God will use your character to reach the people at your <laughs> retreat. What we're looking for and what we hope we've done in, with the opening remarks is to give you some components that have traditionally gone into the opening remarks. You guys, this is awesome. Let's get a couple more. Um, yeah, you had your hand up first, so come on back up. I don't think I introduced myself the first time. I'm Thomas, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hey, Thomas. What I hear, there's two camps here, and maybe the, the thing I'm going to say might help us going forward, and maybe I'm ahead of you Okay. and all these other I'll questions. You if you are. And the two camps is the word universal and open. So in other words, universal will be like this book. Yeah. You know, every retreat will use this book. So then I'm... What we're here for is to create this manual, I guess. So do you want the manual to be universal, you know, for uh, Joel Smith in Los Angeles to start uh, with, with a basic idea with a heartfelt delivery, or do you want it universal? And I think that could be a very important mainstay where it isn't so uh, legalistic that you've got to do A, B, C, and D, and like you said, there's no heart in it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just Good. throwing that yeah. out there. Okay. So what we want, if our options, you know, let's stick within his framework. If our options are universal and open, we want universally open. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I, well, can I clarify something? Just one quick second. I wasn't talking about universal that way. I was talking about the message of came to believe when we are trying to attract the right. newcomer. That, okay. That's what I'm All right, come on up. 
Let's get somebody that's young and a little bit less seasoned here. Hi, my name is Robin Bright, and I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Um, I'm very new to this. My first came to believe was this last November, and now I'm here, so I don't really know anything. So I'm, I'm very new. Um, the only part that I heard, and the most important part that I heard um, last November, was when Steve came up, and I think it does need to come from a person, regardless of what you put in a movie, like yeah. the history and all of that, because I'll be honest with you, I don't know very much about Clarence. I don't know very much about all of that. My ears perked up. I did not like AA. I had a real problem when I was going through um, treatment with AA because I didn't like to keep coming to a meeting time after time and say, hi, my name is Robin Bright and I am an alcoholic. I was like, this is horrible for my life. And so when Steve came up here and personally said to me, you will recover that's all I heard. And I think that that is like the most important thing to the newcomer is they need to hear that from another person that they will recover. No, don't go away. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. It's a great point. That's now, awesome. help me here. Do we ever inform somebody into faith? If I give you enough information, will you have faith? No, you have to give me hope that, and you're telling me that how it happened to you, so I'm going to cling to how did it happen for and you. And in your story, your hope came through what he said, didn't it? Yes. So our hope, we, we hope springs through people. Yes. God yes. uses us. Yes. So it's vital that there is a personal message, a personal invitation, isn't it? Yes, that's all I care about, Thank is you. that I can recover. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> all right. Yeah, you had your hand up. Come on up here, Sarah. Everybody, my name is Sarah Rivers, and I'm a recovered alcoholic. Um, maybe I read this question a little differently when it said how, and it, I get this video question being kind of everyone's on it with history, and that would be the video is the history portion of it, but the introduction is so much more than the history. It's so much more than that, and um, we, I have been um, one of the ones that have been horrible about forgetting or not doing a great introduction and um, so when I looked at this question and the second part of it is how would you incorporate that into your retreat my first thought was give me bullet points on you might want to include this you might want to include this you might want to include this and I just wanted to get that out there that if we could as you go through to include this, include this, include this, maybe get a Word document um, or a Google document that's a living document that could be changed mm -hmm. as life goes on because we're finding life is changing and life is going on. It's, we're looking for techie people to take this stuff over so that in 10 years as we're doing these retreats and oh, we need to add this now because this has happened in the world and this needs to be part of the introductions, it can be added and I can go pull it up and go, oh cool, there's the introduction, oh look, that's been added and I can just print it out, I don't have to recreate the wheel and retype my introduction every year. That would be amazing and so helpful. And you can put your own just type it if it's a word document. Okay, so you're, yeah, you're in it's case you guys word, missed that. It's that a suits. word template. That would be yes. amazing. Just to help make life easier as we're getting ready to do the retreat and, and getting the food and getting all the stuff together and going, I forgot the introduction. Well, so one of the things that this <laughs> brings up though that I think we're going to touch on all weekend is training. Yeah. Training, yeah. training, practicing, practicing. If you want yeah. to do it and have it feel comfortable yeah. and easy, you have to practice. And a lot of times, that practice needs to be in the right direction, though. I can practice a bad habit all day long, right? So we are here to help you. You've given us a great way, Sue, that we can do this. This is her bailiwick right here, a living document. Beautiful word. Um, but we need to know what those training methods are you need. Thank you, Sarah. Rick, come on up here. I'm Rick Morrill from Indiana. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hi, Rick. 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 Uh, one of the reasons I came to, came to believe is because we've lost the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's why Alcoholics Anonymous is in the shape it's in. Yes. 
one of my concerns is, and it's what we thought about the video was, it would be a, a documentation so we don't lose where came to believe came from. That that you know we read the big book, and the big book says gay in it, meaning happy. Yes. But the terminology over the 68, 70 years has changed, and so we have. The newcomer coming in is a tech dude. He's not an old guy that's been sober 35 years, you know, and speaks different to him. You know, if you just came to me with the internet when I came in, I'd say, what are you talking about? But these people, these new people are going to understand it. So I think we need, a, a, we need to tell our new people where we came from, but also speak into their language. Because they're different. From yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rick. So, something else for us to keep in mind in each of these modules, and Rick just represented that. Um, I can't give you everything you need to know in the opening statement. I can't give you everything in any single module in a retreat. There are different points for different things, and in your processing of, well, what do I put into my opening statement, or how does that look, or what do I, how do we communicate these things? Look at the big picture, too. Does this fit in the outline somewhere else? Because we don't need a bunch of redundancy. That, people get bored with that. So, in practice, we'll flush those things out. So, Gene, come on up, share with us what, you, what your thoughts are. Gene Morford, Recovered Alcoholic. Hey, Gene. Two quick thoughts. One is, one is that I think it really would be a good idea to have that video so that it's on the website. So somebody can just look at it quick and go through it. And secondly is for either a new retreat or a retreat where somebody's just getting comfortable, if they play that for like three minutes, it warms up their heart, and then they can give the rest of the introduction themselves. So, thank you. So, do we think that the retreat leader needs to give the opening? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, I see Jack shaking his head. Yes. Well, let me push on that, though, a little. You know, we're a team. I hope you're a team with your people that are running the retreat. Sometimes what it takes to be a retreat leader isn't what it takes to convey the warmth and invitation that might be the best person for opening remarks. Do we think that maybe this could be a team effort? Where maybe you get someone else in your team and you yeah. empower them to study and make this their job. Yeah. To make it the best it can possibly be. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Would that be okay? Yes. 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 Come on back up, Gene. <laughs> I really think it's important to differentiate leader and leaders. Because we have leaders. I might be the key guy, but we have leaders. So when you say a leader, give it leaders. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. I think. I think that. Um, I, I think that we need to fo function as a team of leaders. Exactly. Yes, Michael. <laughs> Michael Elliott, recovered alcoholic. Um, one of the things that we was talked about was universal and open. Um, to know that. There is going to be things that are su strongly suggested or maybe even mandatory to an opening and then those things that may be optional, depending on time or conditions, that, that, that as much as we are uniformed, there's also some differences, not just in facility and people and personalities, but in, in style, yeah. that there would be some difference. And, and with that in mind, I would have a, a tough time swallowing a video as an opening every time when that should be something that we're using for sticky uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube type of draw that we talked about building and growing as opposed to part of the retreat process itself. So, and I just do want to say that I'm sorry that I missed uh, the vision and, and mission uh, part and I, I'm just having a little bit of a problem with the uh, more than a little bit uh, with the spiritual belief. Just thinking that someone's going to say, "I really like Reiki and crystals," yes. and uh, and and how about Mohammed or whatever. And and so okay, that, okay, all right. But before our opening remarks, okay. let's 
We, you'll have an opportunity to grab one of them, the people later. For any of you that have a problem, um, hold on, Kim. Um, for any of you that have a problem, grab somebody and, and let's discuss that in the proper venue. Hold on, Kim, just a second. Carol, come on up. One of the things that I found really touching in our retreat openings, and I've gotten feedback on it from other people, was identifying with the newcomer. With my husband, when he went to his first retreat, he, he explained to people how afraid he was, and he didn't know what would happen to him. And the other thing was telling them, don't leave, don't leave your, don't take your troubles with you. Don't leave here with a heavy heart. Thank you. Come on up, Kim. I just wanted to say, when you were talking about does the retreat leader really need to want to do the opening, you know, I think that there's a lot of jobs at a, at a retreat, and it is a team, and I think, you know, that people see that they can be brought in and, be, and have jobs and be included in. I think inclusion is really you know, really important in the retreat so that people know that they can get involved with us. I think, you know, any of the jobs, yeah. you know, not just opening, but any of them. So if anybody wants to do registration, just let me know. <laughs> 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 Nice little yes. plug there for some help by like, Kim. Yeah, outstanding. Yeah, Leo, come on back up. Go on, Kim. All right, for me personally, I came here in 1994. I didn't have a relationship with my father. Steve was my father. He was my figure. He was the authority in my life. He's still the authority in my life. And I think it's important to have spiritual authority in your yes. life. Yep. Someone you're accountable to. Yep. I don't get to make all my own choices. Right. Successfully. I don't get to do that. <laughs> I can certainly decide to have my own will and do what I want. But we're here for a, a bigger... That's right. And that's supposed to guide our whole life. Not just the retreat. And how we live the retreat, but the way we live our lives. I've been to countless retreats, 150 retreats around the country, England and Scotland, Australia. I've seen good and not as good. And God shows up every time. He shows up every time, no matter how we try to screw it up. So we have people that have vision for our future. I say, hooray, go for it. Um, I'm going to keep doing what I keep doing. And that's whatever God... I think God wants me to do the best of my ability. So, so hold on, let's, you, you used the word accountability. Certainly. And I think, don't you, that that has a lot of different levels within the leadership of came to believe at the retreats? Yeah. So we have accountability, yeah. like you pointed out, to right. God, ultimately. Right. And then there's a hierarchy of accountability, right? right? Yeah. So can you share with me, as you've seen it in all these retreats, when that's been healthy, can you give me an idea of how people communicated in that accountability? Okay. Well, there's a, you have a support team. Okay, we have a head. That's Steve and Sue or Jack and BJ, whichever retreat it is. Um, it's not my job to disagree with them in front of people. It's my job to support them and, and hold them up because there's a lot going on spiritually that we can't see yeah. in the fourth dimension that we need to hold people up for. Yes. And there's also, there's prayer behind the scenes. And that goes on unorganized, but it's constant. It's happening. We're seeing things. We're talking to things. We're, ki we're getting things out of here. That's just how it works in a spiritual realm. So I have been places where the team was disjointed, wasn't healthy. And the retreat suffered, and the people still got helped. Amen. Amen. Because God does what He does. We take people through the steps. They, he does what He says He's going to do. But if we want to, if we want to, I don't want to save AA. I don't want to save the church. I want came to believe to be what it should be. It's freedom. It's been freedom for me. Yeah. You know, I've got a daughter who's graduated college and is healthy and happy. 
and she's never been drunk. Amen. It's, yeah. It amazes me that got to happen. So, you know, we all have our opinions. Now, would you agree that within came to believe in this accountability structure and things like that, that we do need to look at, well, so we're putting in this effort, how can we get the most return on our investment? <clears throat> there is no doubt I believe that. Personally, with me, I'm not that, I'm not a detailed person. I'm not detail driven. I'm kind of big picture. So if you ask me big quick picture questions, I'm boom, boom, boom. If you ask me details, I'm kind of like, well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Because that's a, it's something I have to put a lot of thought into. My brain just doesn't work that way. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Dale. Okay. Welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. Bob. Yes, Liz. <laughs> talk about that later but uh, this new person here she comes through the door she doesn't know anyone um, I'm a stranger up here uh, she's looking at me uh, she's looking all at me maybe and uh, she's having her opinion about it and then um, she is listening to what I say and listening to the spirit in which I give my talk. Yeah. So what you said, I totally agree that first impressions yes. are very, very important. Very important. And that you should get the very best speaker and the very, uh, I won't say forceful speaker, <laughs> But certainly no milk toast up here. <laughs> Somebody that can, and also a welcoming, a welcoming attitude, yeah, yes. yeah. which includes smiling and maybe a little humor, yeah. and um, then um, maybe a little off, uh, you know, not exactly a pat message that perhaps you might be reading. I thought she was going to say off-color humor. Yeah. Yeah. No, no off-color okay. humor. Absolutely. This is a Christian retreat. Um, but the very best speaker and the very most welcoming person should be up here. And um, I think Steve does a great yeah. job. I do too. Yeah. Alright, thank you Liz. So, can I see a show of hands of who is fairly... Mike, did you want to share something? Yeah. Come on up here. While he's coming up, let me see a show of hands of who's fairly new to the Came to Believe retreats. Define new, please. Define new, like four yeah. or five years. Been to less than three of them. Less than three years or less than three retreats? Okay, three retreats. All right. Oh. All right. What you got? My name is Mike Levinsky. I'm a recovered addict. Hi, Mike. Um, my first experience was at this retreat um, six years ago. And uh, one of the main things that I had to walk into the door was when I walked through the door. So before I even got to even hear anybody that was presenting anything in the front, I had to feel welcome. Because if I didn't feel welcomed, I was just going to go walk away somewhere and just try to find somewhere to be to myself because I didn't know what to expect and I was so inward that I, didn't, I wasn't ready to hear anybody else. So maybe, uh, I, I believe that the, a strong speaker, as everyone else had already spoke about, but I believe it goes a little bit before that. I believe it needs to be a, a welcoming committee, so to speak. To, to be there to welcome these people to come. So the here. opening starts before the opening. Amen. I believe. Yes. Amen. Yes. I agree with that. Yes, yes. thank you, Mike. All right, so now to kind of finish out this topic, I want to take a minute to do kind of like what we do at the retreats. I want to, for lack of a better word, I want to pick on the newcomer a little. So, Stephanie, come on up here. Yes, <coughs> Stephanie. 
microphone's all here. So tell us a little bit about what you see coming to our retreats and the welcoming, and how are we doing tonight? Are we welcoming? Do you feel like you want to be here? Is it comfortable? <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it's comfortable now. Um, the first retreat was back in November that I went to. Um, I came with my husband, so I kind of knew a little bit about what was going on. Um, I think I would like to see, though, more of that initial, like, outpour of welcoming. Like, because I think at the beginning it was, and I don't know, I was late too, so maybe there was something. But <laughs> <laughs> at, the oh, I see. Yeah, at the beginning, we were late. But um, at the beginning, I did feel like it was a little bit scattered, you know, so that there, so there were new, I don't know if you had the same experience, but um, like maybe just like drawing more into welcoming the people that haven't been here before. I don't know. That's it's awesome. like an army, like right to attack. <laughs> yeah. Love. <laughs> so like Walmart greeters on steroids. <laughs> Maybe a little bit nicer. Um. <laughs> what is your name, Courtney? Courtney. Come on up. <laughs> so how are we doing? What do you think? What did you see at your first retreat? What are you seeing tonight? How can we do better? Um, well, I when I first got here, I was also late. Um, I walked in during the bottle family presentation, very confused. Um, it, so it took me a little bit. Um, we had our clients here from the treatment center, so you know, in a sense, in the beginning, I was like, "All right, well, I'm here for them." Uh, towards the end of the retreat, it, it was more for me. But um, it it was dark, and it was like hard to find where everybody was. Um, so, I, like I said, coming in late, that's kind of my fault, you know. Um, so this is a testimony for promptness, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. It is. But, um, no, when I came in, it was just, I didn't know what to expect for the weekend, you know. Um, the bottle family was a little confusing. So how are we doing here tonight? I think this is great. Do I feel, feel like I'm on a, on a game show. <laughs> well, for you guys that I'm picking on, you got Robin to blame, because I will pick on you throughout. You came up and hit on some really great points, and we have, if we are going to maintain true to, we're here for the newcomer, we need to know throughout this weekend what you guys have to say. Thank you, Courtney. Would you like to come up? Come on up. Hi, I'm Sarah Jean, recovered alcoholic. Hi, Hi Sarah. Jean. So, what do you think about the welcoming at the retreats that you've seen, or uh, how are we doing tonight? What can we change? How can you help us make it better? Well, one thing I've always appreciated about us recovered alcoholics is especially the women, and they always seem to seek me out and love on me. And it's as simple as just a hug or standing next to someone. It doesn't have to be like, you got to love Jesus right now or you're going to die. <laughs> so that you just leak on people a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tim, do you want to share anything? You don't have to if you want to. Sure. You'll ask me what you want me to share on. Right? Okay. <laughs> So, at your first retreat, and uh, at this one, the retreats you've been to, how has the welcome been for you? Did you feel comfortable? And how could we do it better? Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Um, at my first retreat, I, I, I had heard just very little about what goes on there, the steps, the way the old timers did back in Ohio. And, um, and I still went, um, didn't have much of a choice, but I remember walking in and, and uh, people being very friendly to me and like, just like Steve said, people eyeing you up. A couple guys came over and uh, asked me if I was um, um, powerless over alcohol and my life was unmanageable. And I said, I, I think you could say that. <laughs> and uh, one of them said, uh, uh, well, no problem, we just have to hire a new manager. And the other guy kind of chuckled, and I remember I didn't like that very much. <laughs> um, but, it, but it was true, and that's what I, 
it did and uh, <coughs> everything, but uh, but uh, yeah, they sought me out. So uh, we need to seek seek out the newcomer, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I have. There's still room. I still have room for improvement in that area. Mm -hmm. you, you could say. Um, and then you put me to how can we make that better? How I can make that better is a, is a, my, on opening night. I have to remember my opening night, my first time there. Um, I have to. Um, so seeking out the newcomer has to be a, a, a directive for the team that is putting on the retreat. Definitely. Thank you, Tim. So let me ask a question. I think Patty wanted to. Sure. Well, let me ask you a question. For all of you that have been coming around for a long time, doesn't it make you feel good when the old timers, when this legacy group seeks you out? So feeling like people want you to be here is important. And as a leadership team, I think we need to, let's not forget that we need to seek out everyone. If you're part of that leadership, you should seek out every single person. Shake their hand. Welcome them to the retreat. Because everyone wants to feel needed. I know I like it when these guys come find me. Steve calls me on the phone all the time. I love it. Steve's calling. <laughs> you know? That's cool. And as old timers, as people that have been doing it, whether it's the newcomer or the person that's been coming back to your retreat ten times, they want to hear from you. They believe in you or they wouldn't come back. Patty, come on up. <laughs> yep. Well, I like the fact that we open up things that um, we welcome people and make people feel like they're welcome. But we also have to realize that sometimes when we get newcomers coming, we have other people that are coming from, that are in the program. And they might have 10 years or whatever, but we're just starting a new group in a new state in a new area. Well, they want to see that we're doing it like the old timers did it in the beginning because they've been in a group maybe in their area to where they do it totally different than what we actually do at our retreats, you know? And they don't want to believe in the things that we're doing. So it's some way we need to have a way to show them that it was started this way, you know? The first retreat was made this way. We're not changing how it's really done. We're following the creators of the book. You know, we need to show them that that's how we're doing it, you know, with, with our love and, and, and showing them that we're normal as far as we're just like them, but sometimes you get people that have been in the program for a while and then they hear about this new group or this new retreat that's going on, but they don't want to, they'll come with, with the stigma in their head that we're not following by the book or we're not, you know, because they're a little town or their little group that they're doing it in is doing it this way and well I've been doing this for 10 years and this is what it says that you know we want to show them as well that we're not changing how the big book was done we're not changing how we're just showing them that we got to find a way to show them that this is how Clarence did it this is how they started the retreats you know some way of that form so when they're sitting in the audience they're they're hearing our story and our love but in another way they're seeing that we're doing it the way it was originally done, as far as showing them how to go through the books and how to go through the 12 steps and incorporate it in their life to maybe when they go back, they can you know, help their, their sponsees and stuff get through their steps easier. You know, So it's not a, drought, a thing where they just drag it out. So. Thank you, Patty. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're... We're going to need to move on, but I need to. Patty brought up a comment about the continuity of the retreats. She talked about that. and So people can have an expectation, correct, of what's going to happen at the retreat. One of the things we talked about, and if you just briefly elaborate maybe on this, um, one of the things in the last three months we've talked about is if you want to have a Came to Believe retreat, here is a format that Came to Believe uses. We don't necessarily need, we don't want to tell you that you have to have a Came to Believe retreat, but if you do, 
this is the format. Is that correct? Was that part of our processing? It was absolutely. It's a very fuzzy area that we don't want to necessarily address because you're making a judgment before somebody has grown up. Mm -hmm. And if you have somebody new, you don't want to stomp on them before you find out if they have the capability. But then if they find out that they're really not following it, how do you correct them then? All criticism is bad. It just gets, um, it's very fuzzy. And it, I think it's a big challenge for us this week to figure out how much responsibility, what more do we have to give someone in order to give them the guidance, to expect them to do it by reading our minds. We maybe have never really been intentional about that. It's been a, talk, a lot of conversation about how to do it. Okay. So the retreats, we, do you, would you agree, are they're all in process? Oh, that's and important. That is so important because the. I let me just take a minute to tell you about Thursday. So we're talking about <laughs> uh, what Jean does and what we do, and oh, they do it different. Oh, which one is right? And then all of a sudden, it wasn't right or wrong because the conversation, just with the conversation, thank goodness we looked at, oh, well, we can tweak ours and do this because one has, is raising up and one is getting better and, you know, so there's such a wonderful um, support one for another by doing it different and then sharing it and then tweaking it to match your context. But we know for a variety of reasons, visits, people calling and asking questions, um, who was it Sarah brought up about some of your challenges are in the opening that sometimes you neglect that I'm going to use we but we meaning the people that were there on Thursday that are collaborating to bring this better have a responsibility there too don't we there's a feeling on our part to not reach out and help train them isn't there I think absolutely and this weekend Guilty. we're hoping to be able to better do that aren't we or, uh, yes, or develop I, the tools to do that. We develop the tools, but I think what we ha came to the conclusion is um, that it isn't so much training, because training means that I want you to, to high step and you want to do that. Training is, is that we know it and you got to do it. And what we want to have is this collaboration, because we realize all, yes. the more we talk, the more we realize that every single person here <coughs> has a part of it and we need every single part, and we don't have systems to hear it, and we don't have systems to share it, so that we can all so get stronger. Would you agree that we want to be able to empower people? There you go. That's good. And we need your help this weekend to know how that we can best do that. Is that correct? Yeah, as long as we understand that the empowerment it's a funny little word. <laughs> it's a funny word. The main thing is that we absolutely are ordinary people who have just been around long. Right. And that our memories aren't that great. And sometimes we repeat the same things over and over. And we know that you guys are the future. And we have got to, to let you know that you can do it. <laughs> and share what we maybe are taking for granted. Uh, in a way that becomes <coughs> educational, maybe. Right. I lost it there. Kind okay. Of, I know it off. So, before everyone else does too, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back.